Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Tyro MD's webinar, where each week we bring together leading experts to discuss the latest advancements in thyroid cancer and thyroid research. Today, we're joined by Dr. Andrew Giacakis from UCLA. So Andrew's been up very early this morning, um, and he is a professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles, and an investigator at the Lundquist Institute. He is the Chief Endocrinology and Metabolism Director at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. He is an expert in thyroid disorders with particular expertise in advanced thyroid cancer and clinical trials for advanced thyroid cancer. He directs the Thyroid Clinic and the Thyroid Oncology Clinic at UCLA. He also serves as Fellowship Training Program Director. Dr. Giannakakis is a member of the International Thyroid Oncology Group, or ITOG, and the Southern California Thyroid Cancer Consortium. He serves as a medical advisor to the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association, otherwise known as THICA. Welcome, Andrew. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Warden. And before we get started, I just want to throw out a little plug for our um, Voices of Wisdom podcast, which is dedicated to medical professionals in thyroid cancer treatment. Each month, we explore expert insights and groundbreaking research. Catch new episodes every third Tuesday of the month to stay ahead in thyroidology. It's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your favorite podcast app. Tune in and follow our podcast today. So thank you, Andrew. Um, we will go ahead and get started now. So good morning, and thank you again for this uh, introduction. We're going to be discussing a uh, paper that both I and Dr. Warden are co-authors on published in 2024 um, and entitled Real World Practice uh, Patterns for the Outcomes of Radioiodine Refractory DTC. In terms of disclosures, I have none, but the paper, uh, it should be noted, was sponsored by Bayer Pharmaceuticals. So traditionally, uh, in terms of thinking of subtypes of thyroid cancer and histology, it's broken down into these three categories, differentiated thyroid cancer, medullary thyroid cancer, and anaplastic thyroid cancer. Differentiated thyroid cancers um, emanate uh, from the thyroid epithelial cell, medullary thyroid cancers from a different um, thyroid resident cell, the parafollicular C cell, which is of neuroendocrine or origin, and anaplastic thyroid cancer disseminates from um, thyroid epithelial cells, but has additional mutations and presents uh, with more aggressiveness. The focus um, of the paper and our discussion today will be only on differentiated thyroid cancer comprised by two main subtypes, papillary thyroid cancer and follicular thyroid cancer. Um, most of the tumors are de-differentiated de um, or uh, beginning on the path of de-differentiation, but uh, not undifferentiated, such as anaplastic. So in terms of um, differentiated thyroid cancer epidemiology, um, in 2023, there were nearly 44,000 new cases uh, of thyroid cancer in the United States with a nearly four to one female uh, predominance. Um, there is a higher um, incidence um, of thyroid cancer in white versus black people with black people um, actually having the lowest uh, incidence rate among different races. It's also the seventh most common cancer in women with uh, nearly or approximately 31,000 cases per year. Thyroid cancer deaths um, on the other side are relatively low and approximately 2000 and 2023 with a, interestingly, a female to male ratio of one to one suggesting uh, the male gender as a risk factor for aggressive disease. Combining the number of new cases per year and the small number of deaths, this leads to a prevalence of approximately 600,000 cases in the U.S. that we are all following and seeing in our clinics um, post-initial um, therapy, uh, which includes surgery and radioactive iodine. Uh, 
And approximately 5% of these cases uh, become radioiodine refractory and metastatic, leading to a total of approximately 30,000 patients um, that we're mostly going to be focusing on um, today with this paper. And this, again, these are U.S. statistics, not um, international statistics, Since and I'm mentioning this since the paper is an international paper. Differentiated thyroid cancer treatment uh, traditionally includes um, surgery, plus minus a lymph node dissection, depending on um, the thyroid's um, position on um, lymph node dissection, thyroid hormone suppression, and radioactive iodine. Despite our best efforts, however, approximately 15% of patients develop distant metastases, and a third of these with distant metastases do not take up radioactive iodine, and therefore are classified as REI refractory DTC. And we know that when patients uh, from this paper in 2006, um, uh, from uh, the uh, European group, um, including um, Dr. Schlumberger and Durante, uh, they looked at 444 patients. This data goes back to the 50s and 60s. I believe the, the patients who enrolled were who they looked at um, started all the way back from 2000, from 1950 to 2000. Uh, but uh, we can see that patients uh, who do not take up radioactive iodine have um, a very poor overall survival with only about 10% of patients surviving 10 years. So fortunately, approximately 10 years ago, these two studies, the serafinib phase three and lenvatinib phase three, led uh, to the discovery and approval of two agents, um, which uh, finally gave us a therapeutic option for patients that are progressing and radioiodine refractory. Both were um, quite effective, um, although lenvatinib um, it is clearly the more effective drug. Both are effective and um, both have been utilized over the past um, decade. And in addition to the, um, the early um, data showing responses in all comers, if you look at those who respond to lenvatinib, um, the responses are much greater. So all comers, progression-free survival, is approximately 18 months. Um, if you look at the responders and 65% of patients in the registration trial for the for lenvatinib were responders, that 65% of patients in the initial study uh, respond out to nearly 30 years, their PFS uh, to three years, their PFS is nearly three years. So, these drugs are oral therapies taken at home. They, however, have frequent side effects that are manageable but do affect quality of life and are treated with dose adjustments and symptom-directed therapy. But there can also be serious side effects. These side effects include death. Um, the serious side effects can be uh, minimized with proper management, drug selection, close monitoring, and management by an expert multidisciplinary team, but as you'll be you'll be able to see um, from some of the data in the paper, um, the the serious side effects and death rate may be higher um, in the uh, world, the real world experience than we know from the papers. So soon after um, the uh, approval and beginning of use of these agents in um, differentiated thyroid cancer, we began to ask the question, what is the ideal timing of the initiation of MKI therapy? And unfortunately, as you'll see, the focus of the paper, the, the intent of the, the paper was to answer this question, but um, for reasons that I will explain, um, that um, uh, agenda was not accomplished, um, and there remains no consensus on the ideal timing of initiation of MKIs in radioactive iodine refractory DTC, but we did learn a lot 
um, uh, from the experience, and that'll be presented in the next few slides. So RIFTOS um, is the study that I've mentioned um, that intended um, to answer the question of timing, ideal timing of radioactive iodine, uh, of, um, uh, of initiation of MKI therapy in radioactive iodine refractory DTC. The primary outcome measure was to be time to symptomatic progression in asymptomatic patients with progressive radioactive iodine DTC for whom the decision to treat or not to treat with an MKI was performed at study entry in a real life setting. Unfortunately, due to the low number of events and low overlap rate when performing propensity matching rendered the primary study endpoint unachievable. So um, the idea was that patients who were uh, progressing in REI refractory would present to their physician um, if they qualified um, and met criteria for initiation of therapy, a decision uh, was made to initiate radioactive iodine, uh, to initiate MKI therapy immediately or to um, wait and observe in an active surveillance uh, cohort. So cohort one, was the immediately treated and cohort two were the people who were actively surveilled and then some um, would ultimately over time also go on therapy. Those patients were then intended, um, there was gonna be a propensity match performed and similar patients from both cohorts would be compared and their outcomes would be compared and we would be able to compare patients who were initiated earlier rather than later. But unfortunately, uh, there was a low number of events, a low enrollment rate in the uh, cohort one. And when propensity matching was done, there were very few patients overlapping in order to be able to perform this analysis. Some take home uh, points from the global publication and um, the global publication encompassed all of the patients, 647 patients, without a focus on any particular group. Our study, uh, which is the focus of this journal club, which will be presented next, focused on um, the U.S. cohort and compared it to a non-U.S. cohort. But from the global publication, um, we saw that um, patients survived approximately 14 years from the classification of radioactive iodine refractory disease. So a long duration. However, um, fatal AEs were reported in about 9% of patients who were initiated on MKI therapy. So taking these two points together, we felt highlighted why the decision to start MKI should not be taken lightly and should be considered and evaluated carefully. Furthermore, the wide range and duration of survival from radioactive iodine refractory classification with the upper uh, border of uh, overall survival not achieved uh, and the inability to calculate median overall survival from the initiation of MKI therapy indicated um, to our group that radioactive iodine is a heterogeneous condition. So, each radioactive iodine refractory labeled patient ha can have a much different course. So when we classify patients as being radioactive iodine refractory, we need to understand um, that that term in terms of recurrence and survival um, it is, is not um, equal amongst each patient and outcomes um, can be much different. Okay, moving on now to our paper, uh, which as I mentioned, um, focuses on the US cohort and compares the US cohort and US practice patterns to non-US practice patterns. This is the study schema once again, which I've already mentioned, and it's the same for the whole study. 
patients with radioactive iodine refractory um, disease um, who qualify for progressing and qualify for MKI therapy are a decision is made um, at study entry, either to initiate MKI therapy immediately or to enter into an active surveillance group, cohort two. And while in active surveillance, um, either continue to be actively surveilled or if further progression occurs to initiate therapy. The primary endpoint was time to symptomatic progression with secondary endpoints uh, of progression-free survival, overall survival, um, and safety. So here um, is our um, patient tree. Um, initially, 699 patients were screened, and of those, um, 647 were entered into the study, 175 by our U.S. group, and 472 by the non-U.S. group. That's about 27% of patients from the U.S., uh, of the whole full data set analysis. And surprisingly, only 7% of patients who met criteria to initiate therapy um, at the time of initial enrollment were initiated on therapy in the US compared to um, still a, a lower than 50% number, let's say, but much higher than the US, 33% um, of non-US patients were initiated immediately on therapy. In terms of study information, um, this was an international study with 92 sites and 19 countries. As I mentioned, the majority of patients, or the US was the, um, the country that um, participated the greatest number of patients. Inclusion criteria, asymptomatic REI refractory DTC with a minimum of life expectancy of at least six months, radiographic progression with at least one lesion over two centimeters, although the median um, number of lesions uh, and size uh, of disease by resist criteria was two centimeters and two lesions, two target lesions and one non-target lesion. Patients were excluded if they had previously received MKI therapy or were, were in hospice care. The median duration of observation from study entry was approximately 33 months. There are no statistical comparisons after we um, uh, arrive at the conclusion that the uh, primary um, study um, uh, um, agenda could not be achieved. Um, all data are analyzed descriptively and there are no statistical comparisons performed. The main focus of the study is on cohort two and the active surveillance cohort. This is because such a small number of patients were enrolled in cohort one, particularly in US cohort one. So the main focus of the study is to see what happens to this actively surveilled um, cohort that met criteria for MKI initiation, but was followed. And also to compare US practices to non-US practices. So here is a, a partial um, uh, cut version of the clinical characteristics. Um, if you look in the paper, this continues about half the page, um, but we can see that uh, the majority of patients were papillary thyroid cancer across, across both um, the U.S. and non-U.S. cohorts. And here we're looking at cohort one and two combined versus the active surveillance cohort, um, showing that there were not um, great differences between the combined versus the cohort two, because the, we will then focus on cohort two. Um, the majority of patients um, had distant metastasis at study entry. Um, and interestingly, we noticed initially, this was of interest and kind of surprising to us that um, nearly half the patients in both the US and non-US cohort derived from the low to intermediate uh, initial ATA uh, risk after surgery with 25% of patients in the US cohort 
actually have coming from the low risk uh, initial ATA um, group. Now there were approximately 23% um, uh, data missing um, in the US cohort. So that needs to be factored in. Then when looking at some of these other characteristics, time from initial DTC diagnosis to study entry, time from latest radiologic progression and time from REI refractoriness classification, there were some um, differences noted, again, not statistically compared, but when you look at the non-US versus the US cohort, patients outside the US um, who were enrolled were enrolled approximately eight to nine months um, sooner, closer to their DTC diagnosis, and approximately um, um, eight months or half the time um, closer to their diagnosis of REI refractoriness. On And you can interpret that um, as you like. That could suggest more aggressive disease. That could um, suggest um, uh, at an earlier, less aggressive stage. On the flip side, um, the U.S. patients, and this is not well documented, um, I believe, uh, as we describe it, but this was intended to, um, to show that U.S. patients were screened more frequently and progressed at a shorter time interval um, than the non-U.S. patients, possibly um, suggesting, as I'll mention later, um, more aggressive patients enrolled in the U.S. cohort. So kind of a, a brief summary at this point, patients um, underwent surveillance at a higher rate in the U.S. versus the non-U.S. So just simply saying the reverse of a very small percentage of patients were chosen for immediate MKI therapy in the U.S. compared to non-U.S., Half of U.S. and non-U.S. Uh, patients who qualified for MKI treatment had an initial ATA low to intermediate risk of disease. And furthermore, the U.S. population included nearly 50% more patients who were initial ATA low risk compared to non-U.S. Looking um, at our primary and some of our secondary endpoints and comparing the combined cohort one and two versus cohort two, Looking at the um, Kaplan-Meier curves, we can see that there's no difference and that the curves overlap. And now focusing on cohort two. Um, looking at our, again, primary endpoint and two important secondary endpoints, we can see that in general, um, cohort two did quite well with 36 month rates of time to symptomatic progression progression-free survival and overall survival, which were quite good. Time to symptomatic progression um, upwards of 60% um, and overall survival upwards of 75% um, across, across um, both cohorts combined and cohort two and across both U.S. and non-U.S. patients. Taking a closer no look now at those in the active surveillance group, but who it was decided to, at some point, um, go ahead and treat with MKI therapy. We call this group the treated later uh, group of patients in the active surveillance group. We can see that this occurred in 25% of the actively surveilled patients in the US and 40% in the non-US group. And this happened within the first year of active surveillance in 50% of those patients in both the US and non-US. With the other 50%, as you can see, treated between a year and two years or at more than two years. And when we look at the Kaplan-Meier uh, curves and we're looking at time to symptomatic progression and progression-free survival and looking at active surveillance versus those treated later. The, 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 I realize that the, the font is quite small here. So the uh, red line are those uh, who 
received MKI, the treated later group. The blue line is those who remained in active surveillance, and the green is the combined cohort. And we're looking at the US and non-US um, cohort groups. And we can see that right from the get-go, in the US group in particular, there is a steep drop-off of time to symptomatic progression and progression-free survival in a subgroup of this actively surveilled group. In the non-US patients, we can see more of a parallel um, progression, particularly for the first year and maybe around nine months, you begin to have a uh, more aggressive progressing group um, differentiate from the whole actively surveilled group. So we we noted that these were significant differences um, between the U.S. and non-U.S. Um, in the U.S., as we'll we'll discuss further, it looks like there may have been a subgroup that we could have done a better job recognizing and initiating on MKI therapy or some other um, therapy from the get-go because they were more aggressive than the rest of the group. Um, in the non-US patients, um, you can ask why if um, the group that's being treated is not progressing um, any more rapidly than the rest of the patients, why they too, over the first year, initiated approximately 50% of those, 39%, uh, half of those, 20%. Um, so of 39% uh, of patients um, in the non-US group um, were initiated on MKI therapy, half of those um, during the first year, so 20% of the total group, um, why they were being initiated on systemic therapy during the first year if they they weren't standing out as progressing compared to the rest of the group. Um, looking uh, more carefully at those cohort two patients treated later, we can see that the outcomes um, were much worse. So time to symptomatic progression, much worse in both the US and non-US, but even worse or the worst for the US group. Uh, less than half, looking at progression-free survival, worse, but worse yet in the U.S. group, and then overall survival, um, somewhat uh, still uh, maintained, but worse in the U.S. group. Interestingly, um, in the uh, non-U.S. group, survival was similar. So cohort two patients treated later, versus continued surveillance demonstrated 36 month um, time to symptomatic progression rates of 30.8 versus 79.8 and 55.8 versus 74.5 in the US versus non-US population respectively. We looked at some subgroups including age. Um, and so I have this as a question mark regarding age as a predictor of outcome. Um, in the uh, U.S. group, patients over 65 seem to do better at, on, at 36 months with their rate of time to symptomatic progression and progression-free survival, but when it came to overall survival, did worse. In the non-U.S., this was uniform across the board, where um, patients older than 65 did worse than those and younger than 65 across the board, both time to symptomatic progression, progression-free survival, and overall survival. So summarizing active surveillance, U.S. patients and non-U.S. patients were selected for active surveillance nearly 40% more frequently despite meeting identical criteria. Cohort two patients achieved a remarkable 36-month overall survival rate of over 75% in the US and non-US with 74.7% US and 60.8 non-US cohort two patients remaining untreated for the duration of the study. However, the cohort two analysis demonstrated that some patient populations 
may have less favorable overall survival with active surveillance, including patients over 65, non-US patients with intermediate to high risk DTC and US patients with low to intermediate risk DTC. I did not show you the data for those um, last two categories. Summarizing the patients treated later, US cohort two patients who received MKI treatment later demonstrated a rapid decrease in progression-free survival and a shorter mean PFS, 5.4, compared to those who continued active surveillance who achieved a 17.6 month PFS. Patients treated later also exhibited a shorter 36 month TTSP rate at 30.8, which was nearly 50 percentage points um, lower compared to those who continued active surveillance. The initial sharp fall off of PFS and TTSP in US cohort two patients who received MKI treatment later suggests that this group may have benefited from earlier intervention. Study limitations um, are those limited to um, observe or common to, lim uh, to observational studies, including the lack of blinding and randomization and the heterogeneity of the patient population, as well as possible selection biases um, with regard um, to assignment of the cohorts. And that is obvious when you consider that the decision to describe MKIs is subject to physician and patient preference, as well as regional treatment availability. Um, so the overall population and the active surveillance cohort may not be comparable at baseline. A further limitation of our study is the insufficient collection of laboratory data to assess biochemical disease progression or adequate um, TSH suppression, for example. ACO messages, a minority of US, only 7.4%, and non-US, 33.1%, RAI refractory DTC patients were selected for systemic therapy. Half of US and non-US patients who qualified for MKI treatment emanated from the initial ATA low to intermediate risk category, suggesting that initial ATA classification does not accurately predict long-term outcomes and that ongoing restratification after initial therapy is critical, as recommended by the ATA recommendations. Overall, approximately 50% of US and non-US cohort two patients who later initiated MKI therapy did so within 12 months of study entry. The US cohort two patients who received MKI treatment later exhibited an early sharp fall off of PFS and TTSP. In conclusion, this large global observational study suggests that active surveillance is a viable option for asymptomatic patients with progressive RAI refractory DTC, as evidenced by the 36 month overall survival rate of over 75%. However, there is a subset of patients where earlier intervention may have been warranted. So thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to try to field questions. Great. Um, thank you, Andrew. That was an excellent presentation and um, overall um, summary of, you know, the, the paper that we we published. So I invite um, any of those who have questions to um, put them into the, the chat as we um, continue to discuss here. So, you know, I'll um, have my own thoughts, Andrew, but I'm, I'm curious in, in yours as well. You know, this question arises all the time when we um, talk to patients, we talk to other providers who call, you know, from the outside, your, your center just as ours, you know, when do I initiate, you know, therapy? So um, we clearly see that um, we may be putting some of our patients um, at a disadvantage by continuing to uh, observe them. Um, and so I'm just kind of, you know, wondering from your perspective, um, 
you know, when, you know, and based on this data or, you know, in your general practice, you know, when do you initiate, you know, therapy for such patients who are refractory and um, are, are being observed um, in your clinics? So, you know, this is a, uh, a personal approach based on the data. And, you know, I think each patient needs to be individualized, but I look for patients, um, to try to treat patients as early as you can. You want to avoid um, treating when patients become symptomatic. You also want to avoid treating patients um, or you want to time treating patients before morbidity occurs. And so following patients um, typically um, initially, depending on the aggressiveness of um, the disease, I'll scan patients at three to four month intervals. I'll back off to six month intervals, usually never um, more than eight month on occasion, a one year interval for some of these patients that met where metastatic disease is sitting there and not progressing and you've scanned them for quite a few years and nothing's changed. But really going past six months of scanning, um, yeah, gets me to be a little bit jittery, but we also have our thyroglobulin. And as long as you don't have anti-thyroglobulin antibodies and the tumor is a thyroglobulin producing tumor, not so terribly differentiated, um, I will use the thyroglobulin to um, help me uh, assess timing of scans, especially in those patients where I've become a little bit more comfortable extending this to eight months or a year in terms of the scanning frequency. And so um, burden of disease is important. Um, at some point, um, disease in the lungs or elsewhere um, in terms of volume um, becomes, uh, comes to the point where it can um, impact um, quality of life and become symptomatic. So at some point, volume of disease becomes important, but more important, is location of disease. So a one and a half, two centimeter lesion in the middle of the lung is not going to bother anyone for a while. Whereas if it's paraspinal or if it's in the tracheoesophageal groove um, and there's um, impending uh, morbidity, you want to act on that. So um, it's a combination of um, disease progression, disease volume, and location of disease, trying to do your best to um, avoid symptomatic disease um, and morbidity from occurring, but not treating too early because some of these patients will, their metastatic disease will sit there for years unchanged. It can begin to progress as we all know, and then stop and progress again years later, or it can take off um, and really take off quickly. And as we learn more about the uh, molecular underpinnings and epigenetics um, and other triggers uh, of disease progression and metastasis, I think we'll hopefully one day be able to identify, for example, um, the subgroup um, in our study that took off immediately that wasn't recognized um, by us because we were enrolling these patients. So we thought them all to be the same when we entered them into the study, but um, did not recognize the group that took off immediately in terms of progression. Um, so one day we may have better tools to be able to identify the group, but uh, I apologize for the long-winded um, answer to the succinct question, uh, but uh, no. the, yeah. Yeah, though no, that's great. I mean, I, I think about that, you know, those those factors as well. I mean, like you use, you know, calcitonin doubling times in medullary thyroid cancer and, you know, is a, a predictor of, you know, more aggressive versus, you know, less aggressive disease and even some, you know, differentiation there as well. Um, but I, I, I do the same thing. I, I will be honest, I'll do the same thing. And um, when I, you know, think about, you know, this study in, in particular, you know, we have limitations, obviously, too, that we didn't know 
um, the genetic drivers, you know, of patients. So there could be, you know, that factor as you uh, alluded to, and as we learn more about, you know, the the, the genetics uh, of this disease and how we treat people, we can you know, probably be more successful, obviously. But you know, the we don't we didn't have, you know, bone, you know, uh, disease versus uh, pulmonary disease. And I do agree that the smaller volume of disease and pulmonary disease, those patients do much better um, with treatment. And, you know, I was kind of wondering too, you know, as I, we, you know, think about this paper and you talked about it more today, um, you know, the follow-up, um, there's a, a couple of thoughts here too, that, um, well, first of all, you know, with the progression uh, in, in this is the real world experience when people come in, um, sometimes we have a tendency to to look at, you know, previous CT scans and the radiologists say, you know, overall stable. But if we went back and looked at, you know, scans, just like we did for study criteria, you know, for select or, or decision, you know, we looked at that, you know, these people are kind of marching along or actually truly progressing. But, you know, overall, you know, different radiologists who read these things, they, they the gestalt is that it's stable, where sometimes I wonder if, you know, truly there is more progression than we give credit to just as we are all busy, you know, in these clinics. The other thought I had too was, and me to comment about this, is that, um, you know, the U.S. versus non-U.S., you know, the follow-up in terms of, you know, side effect management, you know, that obviously wasn't part of our, you know, study here to report the the AEs and this kind of thing. But I, I do kind of wonder if, you know, that could play into this where people do you think perhaps followed more closely, um, where people here necessarily, you know, weren't because there weren't established, you know, criteria for, for managing that. And if that could have, have made a difference, you know, in the outcomes, you know, as well. Any thoughts there? Yeah. So in terms of the adverse outcomes, I made the point um, as was made in the um, international paper, paper regarding the fatal AEs uh, and yeah. also non-fatal AEs were increased and um, clearly higher numbers than what is published in the uh, initial registration trials because patients um, in uh, real world practice are not followed as closely, monitored as closely, scanned as closely um, right. as they were in the original uh, study. So, um, uh, so absolutely true that the, as would be expected, um, uh, the, the adverse events uh, and the impact uh, on quality of life um, is likely more significant and so we need to be careful. I mean, I, I put that slide up there so that we, you know, we we understand why this question is so important. There are side effects that can be significant and lethal. Um, at the same time, you have a disease where a the majority of patients will do well for a long time. Um, and um, in this case, in, in this observational cohort, um, a median of 14 years from the time of radioactive iodine uh, refractory designation, but there's a subgroup that will, you know, that's on each side of this bell curve that will, um, that will, uh, progress much earlier and, um, being able to recognize and treat that group differently than the whole group is I think what's important and what is the challenge for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think, too, just as we talk about, you know, TKI therapy, the importance of, well, lymvatinib is the, the drug of most people's drug of choice um, for obvious reasons. The response uh, progression free survival being higher than that of, you know, serafinib um, and the toxicity profile obviously being uh, quite uh high as well, but how dose matters. Um, it's interesting, we just you know published a real world experience with um, in the United States with lymvatinib and you know surprisingly um, over you know 60 to 70 percent of people actually started on you know 24 milligrams. I was when we looked at the data I was kind of surprised because of the toxicity people fear that maybe they would start at lower doses. You know there's a previous paper that Marcia and, and colleagues published looking at the 24 versus 18 and that people um, will develop side effects, whether you get 18 or 24, um, but the responses are better, you know, with higher doses. And I think that is an important point that, you know, we should bring up that it's, um, 
a higher dose than we give in a lot of other cancers, such as perhaps uh, renal cell and hepatocellular, that we need to follow these people closely. But once we you know, establish a dose, we can go ahead and, um, you know, maintain them at this dose for, you know, a long period of time. And I'm sure you have patients in your clinic with lower doses with, you know, very stable disease. So I, I think that's an important point that we do um, need to br bring up to people that it is important to follow toxicities. Um, and let's see, I think we had a question here in the so Frank, let me go. Let me go back one second to the um, our, our previous discussion about AEs being higher in real world practice, and also our finding of only seven percent uh, patients initiated immediately on MKI therapy. Uh -huh. I make the point that um, this study was even this real world study is not really real world because all of us who enroll patients in the U.S are experts um, at major medical centers who worked on the trials. And so there was a step down from the intensive trial follow-up, but the, the decision on initiating therapy and the um, side effect and dose monitoring and disease monitoring uh, was, you know, and the participants uh, in the study were investigators with experience right. at centers that are experienced. So you have to kind of, ex, you know, take this one step further when you say what is going on in the real community practice. This is really a real world practice pattern at major university centers. It really should maybe just be called, you know, non-clinical trial, real world academic um, data as opposed to thinking that the patients enrolled and the decisions made were made by community physicians because that wasn't the case. So I think you could maybe further extend um, one more step to wonder exactly what happens in real community practices. Right. And I think that's uh, the point of the the paper we just published. Um, where we did involve academic as well as you know community centers and um, interesting the responses that were high and the number of complete responses were much higher than we saw in select which makes me take pause that perhaps you know the comments that you make in about this paper that there are people probably who were treated who really didn't need to be treated where the volume of disease wasn't as high and so they had these you know complete responses and we don't know exactly how people you know judge those they weren't based on true resist criteria it's how they determined you know response but nonetheless um yeah i, I think that's an, an important point so there's a couple questions here in the the um the chat i want to get to so good morning i have two questions um, I am being seen at um, University of California, San Francisco. My doctors are telling me that in their experience, patients having BRAF and TERP mutation are always RA refractory. Is that your experience? Um, and when uh, doing lung scans, should they be done with or without contrast? And what is the disadvantage or advantage of each? Thank you much for doing this, this webinar. So, um, Andrew, do you want to make a comment about that? So interestingly, Dr. Warden and I were chatting <laughs> about the BRAF, TERT, REI refractoriness uh, topic um, before we opened up the, the forum. So um, there are some data that one can call upon, uh, mostly basic science data, uh, and then there's clinical experience that suggests that patients who are BRAF positive um, and maybe BRAF plus TERT are radioiodine, are less likely to be responsive to radioactive iodine. Um, recently at the um, European Thyroid Association, there was a, um, a lecture on 20 years of BRAF, what do we know? And the clear summary of the speaker was that while there may be this idea, hint, suggestion of less likeliness of radioactive iodine efficacy, it's not a slam dunk. It's not 100%. Patients should not be, um, uh, radioactive iodine should not be withheld kind of across the board without any other factors considered. 
and um, at least it's my opinion and Dr. Warden's opinion in understanding and reviewing the data that patients should be given the option, understanding that it may not be as effective as in other patients, but um, that option of therapy should not be withheld. And after one dose of radioactive iodine, you can then reassess and say, you see, there's nothing versus, wow, um, maybe this is an outlier. This is, it, it's just, the, the quick answer to the, the question is, we're not at the point yet where we have data to say that patients, this, this option should be withheld across the board. Um, and it's much more likely than the future, we will identify a subgroup of patients um, that it doesn't work at all and a subgroup where it works just as good as anybody else. And then a group in the middle where it's kind of 50, 50 hit or miss and it's worth trying, but don't get your hopes up. So um, our opinion uh, is that uh, it should not be withheld as an option. I, I totally this, agree. And then yep. the second question, um, and uh, the second question is that for lung scans yep. and to identify and monitor uh, the size of lung lesions, um, contrast is not needed. Um, contrast is needed when you're scanning the, the neck or the abdomen or other parts of the body, but uh, contrast is not needed to follow lung disease. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so kind of moving on here, there was uh, another question suggesting dabrafenib and trametinib, not lenvatinib. What are your thoughts about these drugs? Um, we actually had a, a discussion that last year um, reviewing the paper from MD Anderson, but just, you know, briefly your your thoughts on that. If I think most people went on a multi-targeted kinase inhibitor when we were doing this, but, you know, someone does ask the question, would you consider a BRAF-directed therapy before we consider in lenvatinib? So that's another, um, you know, point of contention amongst experts in the field. Um, lenvatinib is uh, clearly works across the board, works in 65% of patients um, in terms of um, having a response. So that's more than being a responder. That's more than 30% shrinkage and or complete remission, although the complete remissions are um, a, a small percentage. Um, and then there's another 30% um, above the 65% where there's stable disease or shrinkage that doesn't quite make it to 30%. So lenvatinib is quite effective. Um, tolerability is variable with some patients tolerating it just fine and some patients um, preferring to sip poison than, uh, than to take lenvatinib, um, but it is the most effective drug. BRAF yeah. um, and MEK inhibition, either BRAF alone uh, or combined, is effective in certain situations, um, primarily in your BRAF positive anaplastic um, thyroid cancers. The efficacy um, is um, lower um, in, uh, in your DTC patients. Um, the study that uh, I think we're talking about um, was a study published a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, but the data is from the late teens where BRAF, in, in patients that were BRAF positive, BRAF inhibitor versus BRAF plus MEK inhibitor together, there was no difference between BRAF alone and BRAF plus MEK. So um, then you're left with um, BRAF therapy uh, using both, even though there's no advantage or BRAF alone. Um, not as efficacious um, as lenvatinib. Um, and so now you deal with kind of the nuances of practice and somebody's preference to start with a medication that may have fewer side effects, has less efficacy, but then if they don't feel, the doctor doesn't feel that the person's progressing so quickly and is so aggressive, they can then hold on to the lenvatinib um, for later. Then there are other physicians who say, when in, on when in oncology do we use the less effective drug? Never. We always go with the most effective drug. And so there are different kind of um, uh, schools of thought or practices. Um, there hasn't been a head-to-head, -head, uh, but um, it deserves a discussion, I think, with the patient. Um, and 
Um, again, it comes down to physician and patient preferences of how to approach their disease. Fortunately, uh, we're dealing with a slow, in most cases, a slowly progressive disease where, as I mentioned, um, uh, the uh, you, you may have on average 14 years to kind of figure this out. Clearly for patients that are very aggressively progressing, um, I would um, opt for the most effective therapy. Yeah, I, I would too. Um, which is kind of another question that, and the tales of that, not so much with the BRAF inhibitors, but um, as the disease, quote unquote, is not rapidly progressing in some patients, why not initiate treatment at lower doses and titrate up? Perhaps better results may be um, seen in the real world community. Um, so, you know, what the idea here is, well, if I'm so concerned that someone's going to really do terrible on 24, why don't I just start at 14 or 18? And then if they do well enough, titrate up. Um, any comments there? So, as you mentioned, we published um, the paper comparing 18 to 24. The side effects were the same, but the efficacy was not. So now if you're going to try something, you're really saying, should I try 14 versus 24? I will opt for the lower dose and initiating a lower dose, even though I was a co-author on this paper, um, in patients who I'm um, very um, afraid will kind of kick it to the side um, with, the, uh, with a minimum amount of side effects or someone who's older with comorbidities, um, I opt for the 24 milligram dose in patients who are younger, have no comorbidities, are healthy, um, because I wouldn't want to start them on 14. And I know that 18 gives you the same number of side effects, um, but less efficacy. But for, again, more frail, um, older, morbidity uh, patients, I will start with the 14 and then try to push it up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's fair. And again, this is always a judgment call on our patients. And I think obviously following comorbidities is important. A lot of these older patients already have cardiovascular disease. Hypertension can be a very big issue. Um, so we have to be you know, very careful um, as we, we manage these patients. They're not someone you give the medicine we'll see in a month. We have to really do our due diligence and make sure they're keeping blood pressure logs, et cetera. Um, well, let, and me then, say, let me just add yeah. to that, um, Frank, that um, not all patients, um, I had a patient on 24 milligrams that was part of the um, registration trial that stayed on it for eight years. I had another patient who was on 24 and she had some um, hip irritation. So we decreased her to 20 and she was on 20 for 10 years. And she would, she would come in for the study and because we needed to do PKs and she needed blood work and couldn't eat before um, the visit, she would bring her food with her and eat it during the visit because her appetite was obviously not at all affected. And some of these patients were patients with BMIs that were you know 18 to 20 and didn't lose any weight. So I, yes, a, a, a majority of patients will have side effects, but it's not everyone. And so if you, we should give the patients the option of starting, if they can tolerate it, the highest and most effective dose. And if we need to come down, come down. There are other I patients agree. that I've, that I've come down to 10 and because they couldn't even tolerate the 14 and there was efficacy at 10, but that's only because I started at 24 and I work with them and they work with me and we wound up down at 14, but that down at 10 even, but that um, happened to be for that patient an effective dose. So um, it, it's also not 100% that a dose will be ineffective at 10 or even lower than 10. Yep, I, I totally agree, right? A lot of it, my kind of final opinion is that, you know, we got to get a response and we need this response and then we can maintain them at a, a dose that they can, you know, tolerate. And I do, I have people who have good responses at lower doses and outside effects and it's fabulous. So, um, and other people are just biochemically more susceptible to, to side effects and, and sensitive to drugs. So, well, we're at one the- other, um, One other comment on yes. that topic is because now we're, as we talk about side effects and um, holding doses and stopping doses and, and, and decreasing doses, there's also a publication um, comparing um, shorter versus longer periods of giving patients a break. And so- um, the longer the breaks, 
Uh, you, you can have the same number of days off in a month or two months off lenvatinib, but it's better to have short, multiple shorter intervals than having the same Thanks. amount of time off, but longer intervals. So shorter, multiple shorter breaks is better than weeks off at a time. Yes. I in would, terms I of maintaining that. disease control. Yeah, I, I would support that. For sure. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. So while we are here to, to wrap things up, so thank you, um, Andrew, for your excellent presentation. And this discussion was great. The, the comments were very um, nicely said in the chat, and I'm um, glad people are very engaged. Um, so uh, again, there's a, a our Tyra website. Please check it out, um, again, for Voices of Wisdom. And um, we look forward to um, having another um good discussion and topic um, next week. So you can see listed on the slide here is our um, uh, course of events um, for the, the month of October. And um, I appreciate everybody um, tuning in and we will see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.